Praise the Lord, church. Glory to God. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. I feel like I was one of those old cars in a barn. In fact, in uh, my garage, I have a my son's car, which is a 46 uh, Chevy. Same year I was born, so it's 77 years old. Amen. Probably doing better than me. Glory to God. Amen. Good to see Sister Jasso in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Brother Fitch is going in for heart surgery. Uh, stents next week. We need to pray for him. Amen. Glory to God. Um, would you stand with me, please? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. I'd like to turn your attention to Joshua, the 10th chapter, starting in verse number 6. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal. Gilgal saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servant. Come up to us quickly and save us. And help us, for all of the kings of the Amorites are, that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all of the people of war with him, and all of the mighty men of valor, and the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomforted them from before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter of Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth to Bethron, and smote them at Azek and Macadea. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down of Bethron, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them on Azek, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in that day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajel. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. Is not this written in the book of Shazar? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and haste not to go down about a whole day. Glory to God. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the word. We ask your blessing upon the tithes and the offering and upon each and every one of your people, God, that you would protect them and prosper them. And God, allow us to have the joy of the Lord in all of the days that you give us here. And we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name, amen. You may, no, don't sit down. <laughs> Do you hear what I hear? Do you, do you hear? I hear something.
Amen. Glory to God. You may be seated. We are the army of the Lord. Amen. Now, all through the scripture, the Amorites represented our flesh. There's all kinds of places in the Bible that talk about the Amorites being the flesh. And there will always be a battle against our flesh, but the Lord can come quickly in order to save us. Amen. And it's good to be a part of an army. We're strengthened with more people around us than by ourselves. God always assures us that we will have the victory over our flesh if we allow him to enter into our lives. Um, here, five kings of the Amorites joined forces to come against God's people in Gibeon, and the Gibeonites sent word to Joshua to come quickly to save them. They, they recognized they were outnumbered. There were five kings with armies. They were coming against them, and they knew what would happen. And Joshua and his army marched all night to surprise the enemy. They weren't going to stop. They were going to come quickly like they were asked to do. And as the Amorites fled before Joshua's army, the Lord hurled large hailstones down from the sky, killing more people with the hailstone than even the army with their swords. But it wasn't enough to get most of the army or the enemy defeated. There were five kings that were in the cave. And those kings also represent our flesh. And what, what happened is Joshua knew that the kings were hiding in the cave, and so he piled stones in front of the cave so they couldn't get out. They probably starved to death in those caves. That's not a bad idea. When the flesh rises up, you might want to starve it a little bit, you know, put it away so it doesn't get unruly. Joshua knew that he needed to destroy the enemy completely. Because if he didn't destroy the enemy completely, there would be another battle another day and another day and another day. Sounds very similar to Israel right now with Hamas. Amen. And in 1 Corinthians 9 and 26, Paul said this, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my Keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he recognized his greatest battle was with his flesh. It's not the devil. It's not the world. It's our flesh. Most people fall away because of temptations and luring through the flesh. We can't be merciful or squeamish about getting control over our flesh. The Bible says that we should die daily. That means every day the flesh tries to uh, come back and uh, constrain us. Joshua was a man of valor and he got more victories than any other man within the Bible because he knew how to finish the job. Some have been battling their flesh for years because, well, they never finished the job. They, they kept areas of their life still alive, you know, at bay, but they never completely annihilated those areas of appetite. And because of that, someday they could lose out with God. And either we beat into subjection our flesh, or one day it will rule over us. It's, it's so insidious that the smallest thing, you know, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. The perfect example of this is the life of King Saul. God handpicked King Saul in order to be the first king of Israel. He was... Uh, uh, head and shoulders above everybody else. God chose him and put him in a position of authority with a great anointing upon him. But when he was told to destroy all of the Amalekites, he compromised. Come on, got to kill them all. Well, you know, I don't know, you know, this is 2024. I don't know if we really have to be that drastic when it comes to the flesh. But that could be our downfall. 
So if you turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 15, starting in verse number 1, And Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So he was very direct. You have to kill them all. Don't leave any part of it, because it'll come back to haunt you. Starting in verse number 9, it says, But Saul and the people spared Agag, that was the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of fatlings, and lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile in refuge, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, o king for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early in, to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. Sometimes we kid ourselves. I've done everything I'm supposed to. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people, not me, the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So we can somehow justify, we, we don't have to do everything God says because maybe there could be a benefit to you, you see. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Therefore, then, didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Malachites. But the people... It's always somebody else's fault, isn't it? But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, and chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice." 
I wonder if he would have just come clean. You know? I'm sorry, rather than blaming it on somebody else. If you'll turn to Samuel, 2 Samuel, chapter 1, starting in verse number 1. I know there's a lot of scripture, but I, I think it needs to be read. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell on the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence cometh thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man, that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa. Behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariot and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. Verse 10, So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them hither unto my Lord. Now, what we see here is if he would have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, that one Amalekite would not have slain him. He wouldn't have lost his crown. He wouldn't have lost his bracelet. He wouldn't have lost his position of authority, all because he just wanted to keep something that God says, you can't. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. 99%, close to everything, but for one reason, maybe it's, because of somebody else. I would have but my wife. I would have but my husband. I would have but my friends outside the church. Church, after God fills us with the Holy Ghost, the anointing spirit, the first order of business is to destroy the Amalekites in our life, the flesh. It's a process it doesn't happen immediately, but it's a process, God's saying, utterly destroy the Amalekites or the flesh, those fleshly desires. Oh, I don't want to. I have sympathy. No. We can't let an appetite for the things that are wrong to go unchallenged within our life. Our flesh will be our demise just like this Amalekite killed Saul. When David's home in Ziklag was attacked by the Philistines, instead of complaining about, why is this happening to me and all my men? We have been living for you, God. We have been fighting for you, God. He said, I will encourage myself in the Lord. The, the men with him wanted to kill him, picked up stones. Your leadership is wrong. And he said, excuse me, I, I'm just going to go encourage myself in the Lord. And so that's what he did. 
And then he said, bring me the ephod. In other words, I need to get into the presence of God for direction. Instead of complaining, things aren't going well. I mean, is there anybody in here that everything always goes well for you? You know, we could, we could criticize God for the things that are happening in our lives that we feel it shouldn't, or we could get into the presence of God and ask God for directions. I, I can't tell you how many times that has happened in my life. You know, glory to God. So now if you'll turn to 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, starting in verse number 1, it gives us that story. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south. There's those Amalekites again. And Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captive, and were therein, and they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. You can imagine the turmoil, you can imagine how the men felt, because their family was taken away. Amen. Most likely all that they have ever worked for in their life, thinking they could come home and rest, and it wasn't going to happen. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, um, Abigail, the wife of Nabal, and the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all of the people was grieved, every man for his son and for his daughter. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said unto Abathar, the high priest, uh, Abimelech's son, I pray thee, Bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Those are the kind of words I want to hear from God. I have a situation in my life. I need God's help. Instead of complaining, why is this happening to me? God, what's the answer? What do you want me to do? Pursue, overtake, and recover all. So David went, and the 600 men that were with him and came to Brook Bezar, where those that were left behind slay, stayed. But David pursued. He and 400 men for 200 abode behind which were so faint that they could not go over the brook bazaar uh, I'll tell you this has always confused me there are 600 men their families have been taken 400 went knowing that they could pursue overtake and recover their family but 200 decided no, I think I'll stay back. I, I don't know if, if your family was taken, would you decide I'm going to stay here? Uh, I'm a little tired, you see. Have you um, lost something in your walk with God? Because of your enemy, the flesh. Maybe your health, your finances, your children, your, your joy and your peace only because there were some things in your life that you didn't utterly destroy, didn't take care of when you had the opportunity. Well, God is saying the same thing to us. Pursue, overtake, and recover all. 
You can't chalk it up to a total loss. I don't know. I just don't have the joy anymore. I probably won't get it back. I don't know. My kids are gone. I don't think they'll ever come back to church again. I don't understand it, but I just don't have enough money for monthly bills. I don't understand. I'm not feeling well anymore. And God's saying, pursue, overtake, recover all. Amen. Philippians 1 and 6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ or until the rapture of the church. He started this thing with you, and he's going to finish it with you if you're willing to pursue, overtake, and recover. I don't want to be like the 200 men. I'm a little faint. Let, let somebody else go to war. Uh, could you get my family for me? You know? uh, Pastor, could you teach them a Bible study? Because, well, I don't know if I'm qualified. Would you? Would you? We need to be tenacious about pursuing that which we lost. Not complacent, but Tenacious not putting it off until tomorrow before the sun goes down. Today is a day of salvation, not only for us, but perhaps for somebody else. Did you know that Thursday is the longest day of the year? Amen. You'll get up, or at least you'll see the sun at 5 o'clock in the morning, and at about 9 o'clock is still be light out, and that's a wonderful thing. But Joshua knew that he needed more time to get a totally victory over the Amalekites. The five kings had hid in a cave, and many of the enemies were trying to get back to their cities. So Joshua makes a request of God in front of all of Israel, Sun, stand still! And moon, stay right there! Don't move. I mean, you talk about somebody who has faith. You talk somebody who is bold. Nobody could even ask that of God unless they were 100%. They had killed the enemy in his life. And now, God, I have a power and anointing, and I can ask, ask what you will in the name of Jesus. Jesus is in the house. Amen. Amen. We don't have to go look for him. Amen. Well, the pastor didn't anoint me. Doesn't matter. You can be healed right where you're sitting, you see. Hallelujah. You can be delivered from something before you walk out of here, not because, wow, we had a great song service, but because Jesus is in the house. Amen. Sometimes we wait for the most perfect situation or atmosphere in order to believe that God's going to do something and not needed. Amen. Joshua 10 and 13 said, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. So the sun stood still in the, in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. All because of that miracle which happened because of a prayer, Joshua got a complete victory. Otherwise, otherwise, had he not been so bold and said, if you give me just a little more time, I can finish the job. He could have fought that battle again and again and again. Somebody might have a drinking problem and well, you get the Holy Ghost, and God, um, well, he anoints you, and, and you don't have an appetite for it, but it's so easy for the Amalekites to come back into your life. There are all kinds of habits and, and addictions that can come back. I know exactly where I would go if I backslid, and you know exactly where you would go if you backslide. You go right back to where God found you. 
because of the flesh. The day that the sun stood still, you know, the, the whole world was affected by Joshua's prayer. It wasn't just Gil Gilgal. You can't just stop the sun over Gibeon without having a chain reaction in the rest of the entire world. You can't just pray a little prayer in Caledonia that doesn't affect the entire world. It, it's more important than we could possibly imagine. Hallelujah. Some place it was dark for an extra day, and some place it was light for an extra day. Someone had to wonder, why has this happened? Miracles validate truth. You're wondering, do you have to, these signs follow them that believe? Can you tell me, does your church have the signs that follow the believers? We have the signs. We validate the truth. Someone had to wonder why. Who had the power? Who had the faith? Who had the audacity to make such a request to God, thinking that God would hear their prayer? And I'm sure that the word got out, it was because of God's people, Israel, that the sun stood still. Joshua 10 and 21 said, And all of the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Makeda in peace. None moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Huh? Those people, they've got power. Amen. People may not believe our doctrine. They may not believe the Bible. They don't believe the church. But when they see the miracle happen in your life, it arrests their attention. Now we find in Genesis 1 and 16 that it tells us that God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. We're talking about the sun and the moon. The greater light is the sun and the lesser light is the moon, which is just a reflection of the sun light and power. The moon has absolutely no power. It is just a reflection of the sun. It portrays the position of God as sun, and we are described as the moon who are a reflection of God's light and power to the rest of this darkened world. We have no light of our own, but we reflect the power and the light of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, the moon always works in conjunction with the sun. Sun moves, moon moves. If the sun stops, the moon must stand still also. There's a spiritual parallel. Isaiah 40 and 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord. Sometimes we just want the move. God, do it now. Amen. But if you wait upon the Lord, you'll renew your strength. Psalms 46 and 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. You see, it seems we always are looking for a move of God. That if we don't have a great move of God, something's missing. But from time to time, we need to just be still because like the moon, we are a reflection of God. We have the situation in the tabernacle in the wilderness the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke, they didn't move until the pillar of fire moved. They didn't move until the pillar of clouds moved. They knew when to move, and that's something that the church needs to understand. We move when God moves. Sometimes we should just wait on God until he moves, and then we move, you see. Glory to God. What we are really saying is we want to arrest the tension of God. We want him to stay. 
with us. <laughs> don't, don't go, don't go. I felt a little bit of, of you in the song. Don't, don't go, stay here, God. Amen. Glory to God. There have been times, uh, I'm sure you have felt those times when, when you came to an altar and there was this incredible presence of God and, and time just didn't happen anymore. You just felt like, this is it. I want to just stay here. Sun stands still. God stands still for today. Let me feel your presence throughout this day so I can get a complete victory over my flesh. You can go through a 12-step program. It probably won't work. But if we can get a hold of God, just stay with me. All of a sudden, you can walk away without an appetite for the things that have been bugging you for a long, long time. Do we have the same power that Joshua had to ask God to stay with us until we get the complete victory over the flesh? He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard men, uh, especially um, Brother Bill Sisko, I, I remember him and a number of other men who felt like uh, I just got to go lock myself in a hotel room or lock myself someplace and I'm just going to stay with the sun until something breaks, till something happens. How determined are we? to get the victory, the total victory over the Amalekites, sometimes we just have to stay. Amen. Turn to our last scripture, Mark. Chapter 10. Starting in 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Barimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Here's what I want you to see. And Jesus stood still. The son stood still. I commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he casteth away his garments, rose, and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. And the sun stood still. I think the sun stood still because there was somebody who said, Jesus, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He had power with God. Now I believe, and I've said this before, there were probably a lot of other people in the crowd that needed healings, they needed blessings, but there was one who was waiting for the son to stand still for a miracle in his life. Hallelujah. Do you need that miracle tonight? 
Well, I don't know if it can happen on a Wednesday night. No, I, I believe it could happen on a Wednesday night. It depends on how determined. On the day you seek me with all your heart, that's the day you find me. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? You know, we get to the place where we've been living for God for a long time. We know a lot of scriptures, and then we have a problem in our life, and, and we want to handle it ourselves. I, I know that that's where I am. I, I can take care of this, God. And God's saying, okay, fine. Deal with it. But maybe if you cried, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me that Jesus would walk right up to you and stand still and say, what would thou have me to do for you tonight? Amen. He has power that you can't see. Hallelujah. He lives in each and every one of us. And God wants to give us more than we could possibly ask for. But we have not because we ask not. Amen. This altar is open. Would you come? I'm laying 